of men. The shadow knows. <laughs> <laughs> this is the shadow. My hypnotic power had clouded your mind. <laughs> the shadow. Yes, the shadow. I'll be there in every empty room as inevitable as your guilty conscience. Because her name is Justice and her revenge for your mockery will be death. <laughs> Agents of the Shadow Report. Thank you for joining us here on another edition of the Shadow Cast, the only podcast on the internet dedicated to the immortal exploits of the Dark Avenger, the unbending instrument of justice, the Shadow. Today's subject will be a classic pulp yarn from none other than Walter B. Gibson, who, of course, wrote the vast majority of the shadow material that we have. One of the many reasons why I decided to dedicate a podcast to the shadow and nothing else is because there's such a wealth of material here, and most people have not read any of it. This is a character who cries out for introduction to a modern audience. I feel in some ways as if Condé Nast, who are the current copyright owners of the shadow, by the way, I feel as if they've let the character down a little bit. They treat him a bit like a copyright piggy bank. They collect a licensing fee, and they're sort of content to allow whatever company comes along to pay that fee and do whatever they want with him. And they don't do a whole lot to promote the character. They just sort of wait for other companies to come to them. And when you take sort of a laissez-faire approach to the character like that, it results in a bit of creative stagnation. Something of a fossilization process occurs, although I... I do believe the shadow is much more vibrant and relevant in 2019 than, say, a character like the Phantom. Characters who are essentially frozen in time and have not progressed. The original Daredevil, for example, uh, comes to mind. But, ladies and gentlemen, today I want to talk about a pulp story because that really, to me, and to a lot of Shadow fans, is where this character truly comes alive. And the subject of today's episode is included actually in one of the Sanctum reprints. We'll be talking about these Sanctum reprints because if you want to follow along with the pulp stories that I'm talking about here, they are of course quick reads. So if I'm covering a pulp, you have more than enough time before the next episode to read the story. You can read these stories in one sitting. That's the whole thing about the pulps. I think a lot of people get intimidated by them and you really shouldn't be. There's not a whole lot of reason to be intimidated by pulps. They're quick reads. It's fairly large text. They're illustrated too. They're not long stories. They really move. Although I will say this particular story had some fairly long chapters. <laughs> it was actually longer by shadow standards. Usually in these pulp reprints, a story will get to about 60 pages, uh, which makes the sort of graphic novel reprint about 120 on average. This one topped out at about 70. So it's a little bit longer and doesn't have nearly as many illustrations as some of the others. Let that not dissuade you because this is an excellent crime yarn. And if you really lust after the crime mystery sort of Avenger of the Underworld version of The Shadow, the version we haven't seen much in the comics of late, sadly, this is absolutely one of the pulp stories for you. Walter B. Gibson, the creator, of the shadow famously said that there's i believe three different kinds of shadow stories that he would sort of cycle through i actually think there are probably more than that but the three major ones are super villain stories mystery stories and mob stories and this is a bit of a mix of a mob story and a mystery story we're talking about lingo this is a very different very curious pulp for a number of reasons. I, I think today, before we move on to talking about the story, you would probably want to know about the story uh, because it's most noteworthy for its invention of some rather curious yellow bat-shaped boomerangs 
the shadow uses to uh, Robin Hood the hell on over to an opposite rooftop to confront the foe in question. Yes, the so-called Batarangs were first pilfered from the pulp in question from Lingo, uh, one of several devices Bob Kane and Bill Finger, shall we say, purloined in the cause of the Caped Crusader. This pulp, of course, was from 1935, same year Superman actually came out. And, of course, Batman came around in, I believe, 1939 or so. Uh, There's a lot of things that they swiped, though. Batman, in an era before jet fighters, of course, before he had the bat wing, uh, he used the oft-forgotten bat gyro, which is just a gyrocopter, to ferry himself from place to place. A clear swipe job of the Shadow's auto gyro. Though it makes considerably less sense, given that Batman has no agents, (laughs) <laughs> you know, the Shadow has Miles Crofton. But because Batman has no agents, therefore nobody can fly the thing over to him if he happens to be in some impassable location. So it was really kind of a me too, hey, 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 I want to be the Shadow too, kind of a situation. Uh, he also copied The Devil's Whisper. We'll talk about that when I get to a pulp story called The Hydra. Uh, the Devil's Whisper, for those who don't know, is an old trick Walter B. Gibson took from his stage magician days. Uh, for those unaware, Gibson also doubled as Harry Houdini's biographer and even sold Houdini his last magic trick, the Chinese sticks, which he never got to perform before his death. The Devil's Whisper is really simple. You you put a special chemical on your thumb, and you put another reactive chemical on your forefinger, knowing full well that when the substances come into contact, the result is an explosion. It's it's a massive sort of flashbang. But it's it's a big explosion, but it's not a super hot explosion or a super powerful one. It's only for truly experienced prestidigitators, mind you, given the risk of scorching your fingertips off. But if you've read any Batman comics, you know, especially early ones, you know that both Batman and the Joker stole this trick from the Shadow. Like I said, when we get to a pulp story by the name of the Hydra, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But how about the story itself here? today we understand the batman crossover the sort of san- the sanctum reprint here in- is actually kind of a batman special and lingo is the first story the second story is partners of peril which a lot of you may have heard me talk about it was the story that batman i mean it, it must be said bob kane and bill finger plagiarized that story not only did they take the plot of partners of peril but they actually traced some artwork (laughs) from the pulp i mean it was not subtle i don't know how nobody caught on to this i guess because the shadow pulps when they were reprinted throughout the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s they did not reprint the artwork so a lot of people just didn't notice and batman's earlier comics for a long time they didn't print them because batman uses a gun because he was such a shadow clone, he literally had a 45 automatic in the early days. So DC kind of buried those stories for a long time. And now we kind of know why. <laughs> it was pretty obvious what was going on. And uh, Bill Finger, of course, admitted it shortly before his death, I think in the 90s. Bob Kane, of course, never copped to it. You, We'll talk about that when we get to... Partners Apparel will actually cover that story fairly soon. There's an audio book of it, too, so we'll have some cool audio clips for that. I really like this story on a lot of levels. I was taken by Lingo. The story is really different. I think it's further curious for being named after the titular Lingo character, who's actually a lesser lieutenant in a New York crime cabal rather than the primary big bad, who in this story is a guy by the name of Rook Hollister. Uh, Lingo, as his name suggests, is really little more than an underworld interpreter, cultivating criminal alliances betwixt the Italians, the Spanish, and particularly the Chinese and Japanese, using not his fists, but his mastery of language. It's a really interesting slant on sort of the traditional criminal of the 1940s that I, I really could have easily enjoyed seeing explored to fruition. But given the pace of pulp stories, we understandably sort of decline to linger on it. And speaking of the criminals themselves, if Walter B. Gibson has one flaw, you know, I love the guy. I think he's an absolute American treasure in literature. But if he has one flaw, it's it's too... Honestly, it's sort of a dual flaw. And it's 
he has a capacity sometimes, I don't know if it's because he's rushing or whatever, sometimes he'll introduce a lot of characters. He will not describe them terribly accurate, adequately, or he'll just throw a lot of details at you and nothing really sticks in your head. And then they'll just start talking, and it's a bunch of new characters you've never met before, and they're all having a big expository sequence that's very, very important. I remember reading the Shadow Pulp, The London Crimes, and there were several points in that story where I was just like, who are all these characters? I'm trying to keep them all straight. Fortunately, he does not do that. When Walter B. Gibson is in his element, he does not make that mistake, and he doesn't make it here. He does a really, really good job of giving every single member of this gang, and there's quite a few of them, and they're all important. He gives all of them a really distinctive name, a really distinctive look. All of them are incredibly easy to remember. Um, there's, of course, Rook Hollister is the big one. You have, uh, Blitz Schumbert. You have Louis Caparani. That's probably the only one who has a normal name. There's a guy named Buzz. Uh, I think there's a guy named Turk. No, no, no. Trip Burley. That was his name. Trip Burley. The, and he really, by giving you good descriptions, like I can imagine in my head right now, uh, Blitz Schumbert has sort of a Roman nose, like a flat nose, and he's sort of stocky. Right. And lingo, the description of lingo is excellent and evocative. And it's, you know, that he's this long, lean guy with this huge Jay Leno chin and this really flat nose. And he looks kind of deformed and bizarre. And he has this uh, curious little sideways smirk and these shifty eyes. And it's, you know, really evocative, really allows you to keep all the characters straight, which is so crucial. For a story like this that, you know, all pulps are plot driven. And if you can't in your head picture who's talking and when and for what reason and who's doing what, it's especially in a story like this with an entire criminal gang who are being featured very, very easily. You can get confused. But Walter B. Gibson doesn't make that mistake here. And probably lingo is the easiest to remember. I, you do lose a couple of them. But even the one Louis Caparani. You know, you just picture this, you know, a guy so Italian when he gets in his car, the oil light comes on. You know, it's very easy to kind of keep some of these guys uh, straight, even when they have sort of normie names like Louis Caparani. But, you know, you have all the Chinese characters, all of the different multi... It's a very multi-ethnic group because Lingo is sort of facilitating this communication between the different groups. But the, the main... The plot is essentially Rook Hollister is running this crime cartel and the shadow is on to him and he knows the shadow is on to him and it must be said this is fairly ahead of its time because nowadays in 2019 all these hacky comic book writers are writing all these stories where well superheroes you know there's all these unintended consequences of superheroes and they all feel so pleased with themselves and so clever you know the alan moores of the world and Honestly, even the Frank Millers to a degree or, you know, the Brian Michael Bendises who all think, oh, we're, we're the first ones to explore this idea. But truly, in this story from 1935, they're already exploring this idea because the whole idea is the shadow is too good at his job. He's cutting the criminals off at the past too many times, and he's actually creating more chaos by doing it. So this is actually a very modern idea, and... Given that it's 1935, I think this might be the first time this is really explored in not just pulps, but any kind of fiction. I mean, this is ample territory now in 2019 in comic books, certainly, but in 35, I mean, Christ, basically the shadow has been ruining the bad guy's day. And so now the criminals are starting to turn on each other and they're creating more problems on the street and it's creating problems for the cops and there's collateral damage. And so the shadow has to come up with a really creative way to actually take them down. And Rook Hollister only took over the crime cabal not too long ago. His previous predecessors were all wasted or went away to prison or whatever, and he kind of can see the writing on the wall. Rook Hollister's a clever guy. And it's also mentioned that he's uncommonly handsome, <laughs> which is, is key here. It's actually a very important plot device because Rook Hollister gets the idea he knows he's going to be bumped off, you know, just the nature of the criminal underworld. You can only preside over so many failures, so many failed heists and whatnot, until eventually your lieutenants turn on you. And Lingo, 
who the story is named after is just this interpreter the whole time. He's just sort of this background figure. And then what happens is Rook Hollister figures, you know, I know I'm going to get bumped off. So how about I just fake my own death? <laughs> and it's a genius little plot device. What would happen? You know, just have a crime lord fake his own death and then vanish on into the sunset. Then he can step back and see who exactly is stabbing in the back because he thinks it might be the shadow. He thinks it could be, uh, you know, somebody on the police who has someone in his crew on his payroll. He thinks maybe he's getting stabbed in the back by one of his lieutenants. He's not quite sure. He's just in kind of paranoid mode. So he figures if he kill if he fakes his own death, then he'll be able to just sort of step back, play puppet master for a bit and keep it real close. So that's exactly what he does. He fakes his own death. And he sets up a situation where he kind of kind of ingenious. He has a detective on his payroll uh, whose name escapes me. Uh, there's a, a crooked detective, kind of a Scott Shelby in Heavy Rain situation. Actually, he's described very much like Scott Shelby, kind of a dumpy guy with big jowls and sort of tired eyes, very much like uh, Scott Shelby from <laughs> Heavy Rain. And he's got this guy in his payroll. He's basically a crooked detective. And because he's a private dick, he does have some access. This is a story, I believe, where Weston, Commissioner Weston, is not here. This is um, when the other police commissioner has taken over. And there's a number of these stories, actually, where this guy, Wainwright Barth, who actually, if you watch the Shadow movie, the 1994 Alec Baldwin film, it's not Commissioner Weston who is sort of a Commissioner Gordon type. It's not him who is the police commissioner in that movie, but it's actually Wainwright Barth. And the reason why they had it be Wainwright Barth is basically Commissioner Weston is this incredibly... He's sort of mercurial. He's sort of quick to anger, but he's essentially affable and a good guy, right? Wainwright Barth is incompetent and there's even some slight suggestion maybe i don't know i don't know if corrupt is the word but he'll squash a legitimate investigation just out of spite sometimes and you kind of wonder whose side he's really on sometimes so you have wainwright barth and uh, the, the private detective is, is actually uh bart uh, Bart Copland, this incredibly crooked cliche detective <laughs> this private dick is sort of keeping tabs on the cops the cops are clearly getting tipped off through Cardona, who I don't believe Cardona is an agent of the Shadow just yet, but the Shadow definitely makes sure that he passes information on to him, and primarily in this story he uses Clyde Burke, who is one of his agents who works for the Evening Classic, which is a newspaper, a, a, a daily, I think. Actually, there's a lot of agents of the Shadow in this story that you don't see in a lot of the other ones. This is one of the few stories that employs the services of Jericho Druk, who is an African, which is very ahead of... I mean, this is 1935, ladies and gentlemen. One of the agents of the Shadow was a black man, and he is not depicted as a dope. Even though he does use sort of African street slang of the period, which is, again, that is appropriate for the period. And it's kind of a form of language and communication that they actually fashion themselves. It's not actually a racist invention of white men. This is one of the things that bothers me about contemporary pulp readers is a lot of them sort of project contemporary mores onto uh, culture from the 1930s it doesn't mean walter b gibson was racist in fact he was anything but racist if you look into things that he said politically or socially he was actually fairly ahead of his time he had jericho druk who was this african agent and at the same time he was not a boob he was incredibly useful he was smart he was clever he was on top of it. He didn't mess up and put the shadow in a bad position. In this story, Jericho Druk is recruited in order to keep an eye on the crime boss uh, after the crime boss fakes his own death. He basically, he sets up a fake casting call. And the idea being that if he sets up a casting call across the nation, between all of the applicants, he's got to find somebody who looks enough like him that he could be mistaken for some kind of double. And who knows, maybe if he gets there, they could fix it up with plastic surgery if he's not quite a dead ringer. But they find a dead ringer. A guy comes all the way from, I think, San Francisco. 
he was like an extra in a Western show or something a long while back, but just couldn't quite break into it. Something went wrong and his career went awry. So he shows up and this detective, Bart, he sort of jollies him into Rook Hollister's apartment, his great big loft there with the secret elevator, which is very key to the plot. He leaves him there, essentially hoping to incite a case of mistaken identity because he knows killers are coming for him. And so here's this poor Patsy sitting up there, smoking cigars, thinking he's finally got a proper film role. And in comes Trip Burley. One of the basically the idea is whoever kills Rook Hollister is going to become the new crime boss. So Trip Burley is on it. He steals up into the loft. And he surprises him, and he kills him. But the shadow's watching all the while. And I'll read a passage from that so you can get a sense of the scene. Of a sudden, the door slid open to reveal the lighted elevator. Caught in his strange attitude, Trip was momentarily paralyzed by the sight before him. Almost sure that it would be Rook or Bart, convinced that an intruder would certainly be someone of a slinking type, the killer was totally unprepared for the surprise that he received. The occupant of the elevator was the shadow, cloaked form fully revealed in the light, eyes burning from beneath extended hat brim. The grim avenger was clutching a leveled automatic in one fist, its muzzle ready to cover anyone who might plan to block his way. The Shadow had taken a dangerous trip, but in so doing, he had counted upon the chance that visitors other than Trip Burley might be users of this secret lift. He had come up with the belief that any blocker would be prepared to challenge as an opening. The sudden click of the light switch at the top of the shaft had increased the Shadow's quickness. He had found the release for the door. He had held an automatic ready while his free hand had pressed the catch. The Shadow was in light, an open target for Trip Burley. But the mob leader himself was also visible to the shadow. Trip had relied upon the semi-gloom of the dressing room, forgetting that it was caused by the light from the living room and that he was standing directly between the elevator and the living room door, where Trip saw a sinister, terrifying figure that even the bright light could not fully reveal. The shadow saw a skulking outline framed against the light from the door of the living room, where Trip faced a big automatic, the shadow spotted the telltale glitter of a puny revolver. The shadow was prepared for the sight of some crouching foe. Trip, in turn, had foreseen the possibility of an enemy in the elevator. But where the shadow's antagonist was the type he had expected, Trip's enemy was more formidable than he had anticipated. In hand-to-hand -hand encounter, the shadow frequently relied upon the surprise which he created through his own appearance. Time and again, evil fighters had quailed at the crucial moment. Only the most notorious of Mobland killers were competent to meet the Shadow without a flinch. Trip Burley was a second raider. Rook Hollister had chosen him as a tool because of that very fact. The Big Shot had known that Trip could do a job like the slaying of Donald Manthell, hence he had appointed him to that task. But the sight of a foe who could strike back was enough to make Trip falter. The opening door had given him the advantage. Trip had the bead and was ready to use it but his trigger finger lacked the quickness of response required for this moment. Amid the roar of the second elevated train came the burst of a gun accompanied by long-tongued flame. The flash was from the shadow's automatic. Delivered with split-second swiftness, it ended Tripp's attempt. The mob leader sagged, his finger slipping from the trigger of his revolver. Now, really, one of the common elements that you notice with all of these shadow stories, all the best ones, is that Walter B. Gibson is really writing a crime story where the bad guys win, and then he sort of drops the shadow in to ruin the day, right? The idea is you almost figure, and in fact, I vaguely remember reading in the shadow scrapbook that Walter B. Gibson literally wrote that way sometimes, where he would write basically a story from beginning to end where the bad guys win, and then he'd go through in a second draft and he'd just plop the shadow in at crucial moments so that the bad guys didn't get away with it. And that's definitely what happens here. The shadow is always one step ahead. And in fact, you have no idea how far ahead he is. As always, the best shadow stories, there's a level of omnipotence that you sort of anticipate and you never are sure just quite how well he has it figured out. Very, very Sherlock Holmesian. You can see the Sherlock Holmes influence here. So the idea is Trip Burley is sort of going to be Rook Hollister's patsy. He plans that he's going to rule in his stead and they can, they can sort of root out the rat. So the shadow comes in and ruins everything. He kills Trip Burley, 
Now, here's Donald Manthel, which is the name of the actor, who's laying on the floor. <laughs> Trip Burley is laying there. And the shadow sets up the situation. He, he takes a gun, I believe, and he moves the guns around so it looks like they killed each other. Then he leaves. And then who shows up but Lingo? Lingo uses his abilities of interpretation of various languages to discover the existence of the secret freight elevator to the loft there. Uh, he uses a contact within the Japanese criminal underground who used to be an elevator operator for Rook Hollister. And so he jumps up there and he finds both men dead. And so what does he do? He sets up the scene to look like Rook Hollister, or the person he thinks is Rook Hollister, had been anticipating an assassin, was ready for him, killed Trip Burley, and he was just kind of gloating, and he had turned toward the window, and he was uh, sipping his brandy or whatever, and then Lingo came along and caught him off guard and wasted him. And he sets it up <laughs> so that it looks like he... And so now, Lingo is officially the crime lord, and so you think that's sort of where the story lays, right? Oh, okay, the story's about Lingo. Now Lingo's going to go from strength to strength, and he's going to become a holy terror. And that's not what happens. Lingo is an absolute boob. He's, he's not a crime lord. He was just an interpreter. He had no idea what he's doing. It's a very unconventional shadow story on a lot of levels. I'm not going to spoil what it is, but oh my god, I will say this. You know... Walter B. Gibson is a masterful mystery writer. He really was. He came from, I believe he was a journalist originally. He worked actually a crime beat, if I'm not mistaken. So he really understood this stuff. When he wrote gang stories, he had a ground level knowledge of it. A lot of the best pulp writers were. Raymond Chandler famously was a journalist for a while. Not a very successful one, as you might expect. He wasn't quite banal enough for any level of success. Yet, Walter B. Gibson rarely relied on gimmicky, you know, twists at the end of Tales. Nowadays, when you think of a crime story, especially in a modern crime movie, you think, oh, this is going to have some sort of plot twist at the end where the director kind of goes, aha, I'm so much smarter than all of you. But let me tell you, when Walter B. Gibson does drop one, you do not see it coming. I mean, sometimes you might, you might pick up clues here and there. But, man, he I have never encountered a writer who hits you with a twist as hard as Walter B. Gibson does. Maybe it comes from his magician background, but the narrative sleight of hand is such that, legitimately, when I reach the final climax, you know, and the last narrative wrinkle sort of flopped into place, even my jaded film noir addicted ass had to admit, my jaw hit the floor. I legitimately did not see the twist coming, though I will not spoil the particulars for you here there's some excellent scenarios here uh, there's a lot of really good shadow stories that take place in chinatown and this is no different there's a gentleman called koi dao koi dao who is a sort of chinese crime boss lieutenant and he's obviously one of lingo's most trusted confidants so when lingo takes over the cabal Koi Dao's position elevates and they were already sort of meeting at this Chinese restaurant at the time it was already sort of their headquarters in a way whenever they had a great big powwow so Koi Dao owns this Chinese restaurant and sort of runs the Chinese underworld so the idea is his position definitely elevates there's a great scenario where Harry Vincent who is the foremost agent of the shadow and will talk about him more as the shadow pulp reviews and no doubt the comics continue he's captured he's captured by rook hollister rook hollister realizes immediately that both he and clyde burke who are both captured are agents of the shadow and i'm not spoiling anything here believe it or not even though i'm explaining precise plot details the twists are such like this is really not giving much away but there's this great scenario where they sort of plant Harry Vincent there and they set up a trap where the shadow is going to come for him and they make sure that they're they're completely out of the way that uh, you know n there's no criminals around and then they set up you know crews of gangsters crews of trigger men in these cars that ran like blocks away but they're all set up to converge as soon as they receive uh, a flashing light signal from the Chinese restaurant. And so when the shadow's there, 
and they watch from sort of cover immediately what happens i like i won't spoil the absolute particulars but there's a really ingenious death trap all the sh- many of the best shadow novels have great death trap scenarios it's one of the reasons that 1940s the shadow serial uh was so great but yeah like what an excellent story it's i'm describing it in such a way it probably sounds like a little bit more banal of a criminal story or a, a sort of gangster shadow story but it, this is really a cut above there's a lot of shadow stories like every now and then look he, he Walter B. Gibson wrote over 200 of these things, I believe. There's there's over 300, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Walter B. Gibson wrote all but, you know, a few dozen of them. He was really rolling. And the great thing about Walter B. Gibson is they're not garbage. Even the ones that aren't quite of the same sort of equivalent quality are at least serviceable because the man didn't crank out junk and you get the sense he really enjoyed the character. He really ex- enjoyed exploring the themes. And even when certain things were shoved into his stories that he wasn't necessarily a fan of, Margot Lane would be a good example. Margot Lane is an inextricable part of the Shadow Mythos now, but she wasn't even in existence for the first six years of the Shadow. She was an invention of the radio version with Orson Welles in 1937, and then the radio show became so popular at that point there was an edict handed down from the editors at Street and Smith who owned the Shadow Pulp that, hey, we really need to find a way to put Margot in the pulps. Reputedly, Walter B. Gibson was sort of grudging about this. I don't know. I've read interviews and I read his book and I didn't get a sense that he was all that butthurt about it. Personally, I think some Shadow fans have kind of made more out of that than possibly is actually there. But he did eventually write Margot Lane into the pulp, so she is a bona fide pulp character. But unfortunately, probably because she wasn't an invention of Walter B. Gibson's, he did tend to make her sort of, sort of a damsel in distress on a lot of occasions. But even in those occasions where something is thrown at him that he's not a big fan of, he he is very very good at making lemonade out of lemons. And uh, this is just either way, Lingo is excellent. I recommend it. It's a particularly good issue. I believe it's number nine. Yeah, number nine of the Nostalgia Ventures Cum Sanctum reprints of the Shadow Pulp stories. You can, of course, find those on the radio archives. You can go to shadowsanctum.com. You can actually get a lot of these from mycomicshop.com. I mean, they're all over the place. A lot of people say, you know, oh, it's out of print. I can't find it. Trust me, someone's got it, and it's not that expensive. I think the original retail price for this I'm looking is, oh, $12.95. So if you can afford a graphic novel, hell, if you can afford two graphic novels, you can afford one of these pulp reprints, and they're great. They've got not only the original text and everything, but they're kind of like a director's cut. They've got all the artwork, of course, the magnificent pulp artwork of Tom Lavelle and Ed Cartier and Graves Gladney and all these, ex- Paul Orban, all these excellent, excellent artists. Uh, they reprint all of that in here. And not only that, but they have these special features. And that, to me, is the main event because the guy publishing these is a guy by the name of uh, Anthony Tolan, who is sort of, he's a shadow historian, essentially, of considerable repute. He was acquainted with Walter B. Gibson during his life. He has dedicated a large portion of his life to keeping the mythos of the shadow and many other pulp icons alive. He's a big fan of old time radio and just absolutely love the guy's work. He does a great job and him and Will Murray really did a bang up job on this one because this is the Batman special and it talks about the sort of Batman origins, the the, the shadow origins of Batman, rather, and frankly, the plagiarism that went into that. And really, when this came out in, I think, 2007, this particular reprint came out, it was a big deal. It actually stirred up quite a few headlines because I think a lot of people were unaware of exactly how ripped off from the shadow Batman was. I mean, they stole... That first story, Lock, Stock, and Barrel. And this not only includes Lingo, which is the first story, but it includes Partners of Peril, which is uh, Theodore Tinsley shadow novel, not written by Walter B. Gibson, one of the very few. Uh, and he's a very able writer. Walter B. Gibson had a lot of complimentary words for him uh, during his life. Uh, but it includes a backup story, not only a, that, but a bunch of articles about Batman and the Shadow, but also 
a backup story that was also written by Theodore Tinsley called The Grim Joker, which is all about a clown-faced crime boss called The Joker. And this came out shortly before The Joker made his first appearance in Batman. Now, Jerry Robinson, who's creator of The Joker, I believe, came out and actually wrote the foreword for this issue. And he says, I wasn't aware of the Grim Joker. So, I mean, look, uh, I trust Jerry Robinson, what have you. But I do think there's an awful lot of coincidences here because even the art included in the Grim Joker story, I believe is a, not Bulldog Drummond story, but uh, Bulldog Black. It was a Bulldog Black uh, backup story in, I think, the Whisperer magazine, which was another really good pulp magazine from the 40s. Uh, starring James Gordon, Police Commissioner James Gordon. Uh, yeah, you can look that one up. <laughs> Speaking of the Batman connection. <laughs> but uh, it's a good little story. And uh, But if you look at the artwork, the Joker card featured in the artwork is like one-to-one. -one. It's from the Batman comic where the Joker first appeared. So I don't know if Jerry Robinson was blowing some smoke up our ass. Maybe it's just a coincidence. I don't know. Um, I'm not even sure if Jerry Robbins is still alive, but either way, some interesting items of Curio, and if you really like these stories, I recommend you buy more of them. They're great. The ShadowSanctum.com does great stuff. Uh, they've got a whole lot of these, although they don't have every single issue, I notice, on their website. You can get most of them from Radio Archives. You can get most of them from MyComicShop.com or, or from eBay and Amazon. Amazon tends to be weird with the pricing on those things, on third-party stuff. Very price gougy. Lingo, a masterful pulp yarn. A gangster tale as only Walter B. Gibson can tell it. We move now to the enduringly popular radio incarnation of The Shadow. For those who are not listening to The Shadow radio dramas along with us, you, my friend, are missing out. And the episode of the week this week is from March 14th, 1944, and it is entitled Death to the Shadow, whereas the Orson Welles incarnation of the Shadow radio program still had its tippy toes dipped into the pulps with his invisibility explained as mere mentalism. By the time Bill Johnston uh, burst in the door, the Shadow was basically just a rich guy who could turn invisible. Uh, fortunately, by the time Brett Morrison, the star of this episode, was cast in the role in 1944, Writers were beginning to explore interesting ways to subvert that established formula. Death to the Shadow is emblematic of that approach. In, for instance, in what has since proven a decidedly modern concept, essentially a criminal comes into possession of what amounts to a closed-circuit television, which is to say he possesses the ability to surveil literally any location he wishes and invade the privacy or security of any man, woman, or business in the blink of an eye. Again, Batman, you're welcome. But, but here, where writers of today would likely explore philosophical concerns like privacy rights, the surveillance state, or terrorism, here, it's used as an instrument for simple civil crime. You know, jewel robberies, bank heists, or some such. And while I do agree that's a tad banal, it's with the way they use it to foil the Shadow's hypnotic invisibility that keeps the concept fresh. Turn this control. And we're looking into the living room. Mr. Crane, look. What is it? The two men who have entered the room. Yes, I see. But there, there is a third man in the room, and they do not see him. Well, but how can they help but see him? He's right out in plain sight. Say, there's something queer going on. I recognize that third fellow. Let's listen in. Very well. We will hear. Well, the old place sure looks good, Lefty. After three years in stir, Finger, any place would look good to you. <laughs> good to be a free man again. <laughs> what was that? Lefty, was that you? It was the Shadow. Welcome home, Finger. The Shadow? Where are you? I can't see anyone. Your brother could not see me either, Finger, for no man can see the Shadow. My brother? Yes, Finger. The murderer the world knew is Killer Fenton. I... I don't understand. Why, you poor fool, you don't see the possibilities of your machine. Why, already your little gadget has not only shown me how to put my hands on a cool half million, but it's... It's actually told me the true identity of the shadow. A secret of fabulous value to the underworld. You mean... You would use my instrument for criminal purposes? How discerning of you, Professor. No. No, I won't allow it. You can't do it. You can't do it. Can't I, Professor? How... 
A gun? Yes, Professor. No! A gun. The idea of using cameras to spot the shadow electronically and forestall his hypnotic invisibility thereby is a stroke of minor brilliance, and we'd see variants of it throughout the radio program, with at least one other episode I can name involving an automatic door with a trip sensor that reveals when the shadow has entered the room and sort of tips off the crooks. It was written, I believe, by future Twilight Zone writer Robert Arthur Jr., who also wrote a few backup stories in the Shadow magazine, incidentally, uh, and he did so in tandem with his longtime writing partner, David Colgan, who worked on Suspense, if I'm not mistaken. Either way, Death to the Shadow, it also represents one of the very few times when the radio version of the Shadow actually uses a gun. My gun is gone. I have it now, Lefty. Now, who sent you here? Answer. Nobody sent me here. I want the truth, quickly. I'm, I'm not saying nothing. I have your gun in my hand, Lefty. Now talk fast. You can't bluff me, Shadow. I know you won't shoot. Won't I, Lefty? <laughs> Now, as you know, broadcasting strictures of the 40s precluded a radio vigilante from killing with a gun, even in defense, but fortunately, this also forced radio writers to embrace more creative ends, and so the alternate methods of murder could be outright grisly, folks. You know, criminals diving out of 20-story windows, you know, grasping live electric wires, diving into vats of acid, being hypnotized by the shadow into holding tight to a live hand grenade. You know, one wonders if the censors truly aboard violence violence or if a mere gun wound wasn't grand enough for them. Uh, I should also mention, as alluded to previously, whereas the show's popularity was certainly established by Orson Welles, and certainly today he's most closely identified with the role on radio, he only performed as the Shadow for two seasons from 1937 to 38. Bill Johnstone served the role for, I think, the next five or so, but by 44, it became a revolving role from Hollywood actor John Archer, Uh, actress Ann Archer's father, who you may know from the Jack Ryan movies, to Steve Courtley, and finally, the man who would don the slouch hat for the next decade, Brett Morrison. Gonna be blunt, he's the best of the bunch. Whereas Orson Welles was taking a bit of the piss, and John Stone lapsed into pure comedy at times, Brett Morrison took the shadow seriously and played it as such lending an austere diffidence to Lamont Cranston and a bellowing gravitas to The Shadow with easily the most blood-curdling laugh of the bunch. He was a famed radio actor who'd emphatically established himself as Mr. First Nighter, but Brett simply put was the Radio Shadow. It's just a shame such a piteous few of his episodes have since survived. This guy did the show for almost a full ten years. And if you include his previous run, a full 10 years. And yet, I I think fewer than 100 episodes have survived. Very, very few of his run. And it's appalling when you consider that almost all of the Orson Welles episodes survived, and he was only on the show for less than two years. Morrison's shadow service actually, as I just mentioned, spanned two stints. After an initial run in 44, for reasons since lost to the protractions of time, he was almost immediately replaced with John Archer and ultimately Steve Courtley, only to re-inhabit the role just one year later and carry through to the show's cancellation in 1954. Death to the Shadow was recorded during his first run in 44, and it kind of shows. Because while he's excellent... One can tell he's still cutting his teeth on the roll a little bit. The laugh isn't quite there yet, but that booming Brett Morrison baritone is in full effect. Death to the Shadow is a cut above for a fact. I think this is one of my favorites, certainly from the first Brett Morrison run. The quality of his run, because it spans such a long period of time, really vacillates, and while many of the radio episodes haven't survived, the vast majority of the scripts actually have. If you pick up an excellent book uh, by the name of The Shadow, The History and Mystery of the Radio Program, 1930 to 1954, by Martin Grahams Jr., It is absolutely excellent. It goes over all those episodes, and I'll actually give you a summary of all of them. He went through all the radio archives. He tried to find transcriptions, and actually he's the guy, I believe, who dug up the most recent recovered episodes, one of which was actually 
actually two of which were Orson Welles episodes, I think, which was a staggering find in 2018. I mean, that's that's pretty nuts that we're still finding lost shadow episodes and who knows maybe we'll find brett morrison episodes in the future but the reason why a lot of them have been lost from what i understand is because at a certain point as radio fell in prominence as a medium with the ascent of television they stopped transcribing the radio programs or they transcribe them and then they would flip them over and they would start they would basically start recording over the programs is what happened. So basically we have the radio equivalent of people taping over their wedding video. <laughs> it's essentially and that's sadly the fate of the Brett Morrison era of the shadow. It's a shame because he really is my favorite. Folks, we'll be covering more of these old-time radio shadow episodes and I hope you enjoy them. And who knows, maybe when we hit the Halloween season, we might just do some more radio recreations. I know you guys enjoyed the first two. I wasn't able to do one last year. I was a little busy, and I couldn't find anybody to edit it. This time around, I'll just have to do it myself, but I, I really want to do another one. Well, that does it for this missive, fellow agents. Until next time. <laughs> As you so evil... So shall you meet evil. Crime does not pay. A shadow knows. <laughs>